joining us here this afternoon uh, for the Committee on Global Thoughts, uh, second uh, of, of the year's thinkings, uh, as we've called them, uh, uh, on the subject of evidence-based medicine. How sound is the evidence? And I can tell you that we've just come from a uh, rather uh, intriguing, if not disturbing, lunchtime discussion. Uh, on this subject that perhaps will be replicated in some form here. My name is Reinhold Martin. I teach in the, in the Graduate School of Architecture over there and direct uh, the, uh, the Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture, which is just upstairs. So welcome to Buell Hall. Um, I'm a, a member of the Committee on Global Thought and chair its planning committee. Um, you may know that the CGT, as we call it, uh, was founded in 2006. Uh, under the auspices of uh, President Lee Bollinger uh, as an interdisciplinary initiative dedicated to developing the necessary concepts and methodologies uh, to think globalization. Hence, the thinking. Which today uh, is, uh, is the second, as I said, in a series, a uh, kind of open series, you can look for more uh, next year, um, uh, that we, we've uh, called uh, or gathered, in a sense, under the rubric of, of rethinking knowledge. Um, and we've designed these as conversations uh, to, in a sense, uh, reconsider the categories uh, under which we, we uh, operate and, uh, and, in a sense, uh, shape uh, the, uh, the globalizing uh, world in which we live. And by shape, I mean uh, empirically, but also conceptually. Um, and, and the conceptual part, uh, as I think you'll see, is, uh, is just as challenging, if not more, uh, than the empirical one. In the October, we, we started with a, with a think on governance. Maybe some of you uh, have joined us there. And today, again, we continue um, with evidence-based medicine, and, and which will be led by David Madigan. I'll introduce all of our participants more formally in a second. Um, who has, but David is, is uh, we can count and thank as the instigator of this, and he will also uh, sort of run the show um, after I step uh, off the podium and let them get going. Um, just as I said minutes ago, we, we wrapped up the, uh, lunch. These thinkings have uh, two parts. Uh, there's, there's a lunch with the participants and some uh, CGC members um, where we, uh, we, we arrived at many inconclusive conclusions. <laughs> And I hope that we're going to maybe um, spend some time with you because this is really an invitation to you to join us in, in this conversation uh, to, uh, in a sense, explore uh, the, the challenges, the difficulties of this subject uh, more deeply um, today. Um, we're, going to, we're going to do this, uh, in effect, in, in two parts. Uh, we'll begin by hearing from our two presenters, Professors David Madigan and John Yonidas. Um, afterward, we'll hear from two discussants, uh, Steve Lohr of the New York Times uh, and our own uh, Professor Wafa El Sada. So, in order of appearance, uh, David Madigan is the Executive Vice President and De Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Statistics at Columbia University. Um, his degrees are in Mathematical Sciences and PhD in Statistics, both from Trinity College Dublin. He's previously worked for AT&T Soliloquy, University of Washington Rutgers, and Skillsoft. He has over 100 publications. We discussed them. The quantity of publications. He's guilty as charged. <laughs> um, I, I won't go through all the areas, but, but they're all re related to, to this discussion, I can assure you. Um, he's an elected fellow of the American Statistical Association and at the Institute of Mathematical Science Statistics. Uh, and he recently completed a term as editor-in-chief of statistical science. Uh, John Ioannidis uh, holds the CF Renbord Chair in Disease Prevention at Stanford uh, University, uh, and he's a professor of medicine, professor of health research and policy, and director of the Stanford Prevention Research Center at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Um, also professor of statistics uh, at the University School of Humanities, Stanford uh, School of Humanities and, and, and Sciences, so he crosses over uh, institutionally and is, is one of two directors of the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford, again a topic of some uh, discussion earlier, um, and as well as director of the PhD program in epidemiology and clinical research. Um, he graduated at the University of Athens uh, and received a doctorate there in, in biopathology, um, and then later trained at Harvard and Tufts, specializing in internal medicine and infectious diseases, 
has held positions at NIH, Johns Hopkins, and Tufts. Uh, also as adjunct professor in epidemiology at Harvard School of Public Health, where he's currently, currently I don't know, teaching a course on evidence-based epidemiology, again, effectively the topic for today, and is visiting professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at Imperial College London. Um, and his 2005 paper, again, Exhibit A in the sense of uh, the discussion, uh, uh, in uh, PLOS Medicine, quote, why most published research findings are false has been the most downloaded article in the history of public library of science. So, um, Steve Lohr has covered technology, business, and economics for the New York Times for more than 20 years. No doubt you've read his writings. Um, in 2013, he was part of the team awarded the Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting. He was a foreign correspondent for a decade and served as an editor and written magazines, uh, four magazines, including the, the Times Magazine, The Atlantic, uh, and The Washington Monthly. He's the author of Dataism, uh, which examines the field of data science and decision making in 2015, uh, and is also the author of a history of software and computer programming, Go2, uh, Go uh, from 2001. And finally, uh, Wafa al uh university professor uh, at Columbia University and founder and director of the International Center for AIDS Care and, Tre and Treatment Programs, which works in Sub-Saharan Africa, Central Asia, and in the U.S. in partnership in, in, with governmental and non-governmental organizations, building in-country capacity for HIV prevention, care, and treat, treatment and related issues. Uh, Dr. El Sadr, and I, I sort of underline doctor because she is a clinician, um, has also led efforts to support the capacity of health systems through the many uh, programs that ICAM has established. Her, her work has also advanced the concept of health system strengthening uh, globally for the purposes of con confronting major health threats faced by communities around the world. Uh, for two decades, she served as chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases, Diseases at Harlem Hospital Center uh, here in New York. In this role, she was instrumental in developing a comprehensive HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis program focused on service, training, and research. Uh, this program applies a, a, a family-focused approach using multidisciplinary teams and engages community members. Dr. El Sadr has led the design and implementation of numerous studies that have furthered the understanding of the prevention and treatment of HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis, and other infectious diseases. In 2008, um, she was named the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellow, uh, and in 2009, she became a member of the Institute of Medicine. So, I, with that, I will um, give the floor to David, and, and then we'll um, enter this troubling world together. Thank you, by the way. Thank you for the opportunity. We had a lot of fun in our earlier session. And um, our plan for this session is um, I'm going to make some relatively brief remarks. Um, then John will do the same thing. And then the, the, the bulk of the time will be the, led by, by Steve and Wafa. Uh, will be for discussion and, and uh, kick, kicking some ideas around. Uh, so I just want to make a couple of, uh, a couple of points uh, in the aid of some slides. Um, so, now the topic is, is evidence-based medicine, and I think if you, if you talk to most clinicians um, and ask them, what, you know, do they practice evidence-based medicine, they would say yes, they do. I think it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phrase that's sort of become very much established as, as the, the way we practice medicine. It's, it's, it's evidence-based. So I want to make two points um, uh, here. They're both very negative. Um, <laughs> not always like this. I just want to sort of say that up front, but, but I'm going to say two things that are there are two points that are, that are both uh, sort of unpleasant. Um, so the first one is, is, um, you know, is, is relates to the way we practice evidence-based medicine. How do we use evidence in the practice of healthcare? Because um, I would argue that we don't use it very well. And then the second point I will make is that the evidence that we have is probably not all that great anyway. Um, so um, the, the term itself, evidence-based medicine, is sort of a curious term. So sort of a question begging. You know, ev evidence-based medicine as against what? Exactly. What's the alternative to, uh, to evidence-based medicine? Um, and I, you know, I don't, I don't think the alternative is magic eight balls and, and, and Ouija boards. Um, so, you know, what, what would we be doing if we weren't practicing uh, evidence-based medicine? So, how does it actually work um, in practice? So, let me give you a, a, an anecdote that's that is, I think, a reasonable example. It's a real-world example of, of how we practice uh, evidence-based medicine. Um, so, a good example is a friend of mine, okay, his name is John, um, and he went to see a, a cardiologist. And the issue uh, at, at that moment was, should John have an angiogram? Right? 
uh, you know, there, there are reasons, which I'll get into in a second, as to why this, was, this issue was on the table. Right? So an angiogram is, is, not, is a somewhat invasive uh, procedure. It's not risk, certainly not cost-free, and it's not risk-free, um, but it provides potentially valuable, potentially life-saving uh, uh, information. So John went to see the cardiologist. Uh, this is uh, a top-notch cardiologist here, here in the city. Um, and I've no doubt this cardiologist would say that, that he and his, that he practices evidence-based medicine. So what he actually did was he produced this piece of paper. Okay? And this was the evidence-based portion of the decision-making uh, about John and whether he should have an angiogram or not. Uh, and so this is the, something called the framing of heart score, which uh, is, is something that many in the room might be quite familiar with. So what's going on here is um, the, uh, the, 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 the physician computed a score for John. And that score translates into the probability that John has a major cardiovascular uh, issue in the next 10 years. And so the components of the score are the first one there is step one is age. So John is between 45 and 49, so you circle three points for age. Then there's total cholesterol, smoking, HDL cholesterol, and blood pressure. And then you add them up, and you get that John got, I think it's six points, and therefore John's percentage, the uh, probability of having a major cardiovascular event in the next 10 years is, is 2%. There, there, there endeth the, the evidence-based portion of the consultation. Okay? And then on the basis of this, somehow the, the, the physician, I guess, and the patient decide whether or not to, that John should have the angiogram. The thing is, we know a heck of a lot more about John, my friend, than just those five little discrete pieces of information. Fifty years ago, maybe, or certainly in the Middle Ages, and in many ways we practice medicine much the same now as we did in the Middle Ages, in some regards. Um, you know, fifty years ago, maybe we didn't know much about John. We, we didn't have the ability to measure very many things. But now there are many pieces of information that have a bearing on the cardiovascular risk that John has, and hence whether or not John should have this uh, have this procedure. Um, so, for example, there's his age. Well, we, that, that was in the score. HDL cholesterol, that was in the score. But there's lots of other things, like CRP. This, this uh, C-reactive protein is normal in John. That's an indicator of potential cardiovascular disease. There's the fact that John's father died of heart disease at, at age 47. There's something called calcium scoring. So John has had a procedure done which measures the electron beam tomography, measures the calcium load in your coronary arteries. Had that done repeatedly. Uh, the scores are low for John, but they're rising. So low is good, rising is bad. Um, John drinks red wine, John exercises, John takes Lipitor, a drug for lowering cholesterol, and on and on and on. So there may be as many as 200 pieces of information that are relevant here um, that, that ought to be used if we're going to really do uh, make an evidence-based decision about whether John should have, have an angiogram. So the question is now, should John have an angiogram? Clinical judgment is what, is what is the physician is now using. So the evidence-based portion was the, was the piece of paper sponsored by Merck. Um, but, but here we're, we're now into the realm of clinical judgment. So the physician, the, the cardiologist, is trying to reason with all of these pieces of information. It's Dr. Welby. Um, <laughs> older people in the room will chuckle. Um, um, you know, the, Dr. Welby here is supposed to use his clinical judgment to reason with all these pieces of information and try and combine that with his knowledge of the medical literature and the evidence base that exists to arrive at the, at the optimal decision. It just seems to be the whole thing is preposterous. How on earth could a human being reason with 200 discrete pieces of information, link that to the vast, vast medical knowledge base uh, about heart disease, and arrive at an optimal decision? So I think we have a problem with, um, with the way we practice evidence-based medicine, the way we translate, connect, if you will, this large evidence base with the, the, the patient-specific data in order to, to arrive at optimal decisions. So that's point number one, that we, we, we have a problem with the way we're, we're practicing evidence-based medicine. Second problem I want to point out um, is, the second challenge, is to do with the evidence itself. So, um, and I, I'm particularly here going to focus on, on large-scale observational database studies, and I'll explain those terms um, as, as I go along. So we now, have, we now have some very large databases of patient data, and it's tempting to think that because we have a lot of data on a lot of patients, we can figure out what's going on. We can figure out, for example, what are the causal effects of drugs. Okay? And medical journals are full of studies touting supposed evidence about effects of drugs and effects of all kinds of healthcare interventions, not, not, not just drugs. So the, 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 there's a lot of excitement around these big data, um, and um, some perhaps some over, overblown claims, which is kind of the point I'm trying to make. Um, but uh, here, here's, kind of, here's why there's excitement. 
There's a drug on the market called metformin. It's a drug for diabetes that's very widely used. About 80% of di people diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes start there. It's the first line of treatment right, for, for type 2 diabetes. Supposing there was a concern that there might be some strange side effect of metformin. So supposing there's some evidence emerges, gee, maybe it's a cause of liver cancer. Right? So how, how, would you, how would you study that? How would you gather evidence related to this issue? Well, if you go back to the randomized trials that got this drug approved a few decades ago, you will find the so-called pivotal clinical trial that led to the, the, the drug's approval. A grand total of 141 patients actually ingested metformin in that trial. So if you're trying to, if you're trying to you know, generate evidence about a potential side effect, a somewhat rare side effect, let's say that occurs in 1% of the patients, or one-tenth of 1% of the patients, or, or one-hundredth of 1% of the patients who take this drug, good luck. You're never going to find it in the randomized trial. There's just, there's just no power, no statistical power um, to, to detect anything. But metformin is taken by millions of people. If, if, if this is a side effect that occurs in, let's say, it's one-tenth of 1% of the people who take it, it would truly be a major public health um, problem. So flash forward to today, um, the databases that, that a group of us here at, at, at Columbia work with, um, in those databases, uh, these are electronic health record databases, um, we have identified in, in these databases there are over a million new users of metformin in, this, in these databases. So we have a million people who took metformin, they're, they're, they started treatment with metformin, and then we have years of medical records <coughs> following the ingestion of metformin, the consumption of metformin. Surely to goodness, we can figure out with data like this, does this drug cause liver cancer or does it not cause liver cancer? Right? That's, the, that's the, the, the idea here. And that, on the face of it, that seems, surely we can do that, right? And, and, and we can practice, we can elevate healthcare to a, to a new place in terms of how we practice it. We can strengthen the evidence that However, there's some challenges with doing this that are, are, I think, more subtle than one might think at first blush. And we're inclined to be, it's sort of beguiling here, but we have so much data. But, but there are some real challenges. First of all, before I, I give examples of some of these challenges, um, here's what these data look like. So, um, let me just do this one. So, um, just to kind of make this a little bit more concrete. So, in this database, we have a million medical records of people taking metformin. We have about 600 million patients in the union of the databases that, that we're working with. These are what the data look like. This is kind of a little hard to read, but um, the hard, they're, they're, they're so-called longitudinal data. It's time-stamped data, right? Medical mm -hmm. records over time for a patient. That's a couple of years on the horizontal axis for this particular patient. And um, we have met the first line. There are visits, encounters with the healthcare system, procedures that this patient had, <laughs> drugs that this patient consumed, um, conditions this patient had, basically diagnoses that the patient had, um, and the, the bottom one there are lab values, blood draws, and. and so that's what, 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 that's what we're dealing with. That's a cartoon version of what these data look like. <clears throat> the thing is, that's one patient. That's actually a real patient. That's not her picture. That's, that's a real patient. There's another patient. There's another patient. Okay? Patients are very complex. People who are, who are many people who are sick are, are sick in many different ways, have many different morbidities. It's complex, right? So the challenge is, I give you a million of these. Say a million of these for pe the person who's taken metformin. And I give you a million where the person hasn't taken metformin. Now you're trying to figure out well, some of these people had liver cancer, some of the other people have had liver cancer as well. How can we figure out whether it was the metformin that did it or not? But these, there's a very high, de extra extraordinary degree of, of uh, complexity here. So, um, nonetheless, these databases are, wi are now widely available. Any bona fide researcher can get access to very large scale patient, uh, typically de identified um, patient level data. Medical journals are full of studies in these, data in these databases that are attempting to make, to provide evidence about causal effects of healthcare interventions. I'm going to focus on drugs in particular here. So here's one. This is a very typical, you pick up any medical journal, you're going to find studies like this. And they are, they are a centerpiece in the kind of modern evidence base for, evidence base for, for healthcare. This particular paper, it's in BMJ, the British Medical Journal. And it's to do with oral dysphosphonates and the risk of cancer in the esophagus. So they went into one of these databases. Um, and they identified a group of people who took bisphosphonates, which are drugs for osteoporosis. They identified a bunch of people who did not take bisphosphonates, and they looked forwards in time to see who, who got cancer of the esophagus in this particular case. And they drew the conclusion, September 2010, in this large nested case control study within a UK cohort, it's a big UK database, we found a significantly increased risk of esophageal cancer in people with previous prescriptions for bisphosphonates. They concluded there's a problem here. This was picked up by, I don't know if it was picked up by the New York Times or not, I think it was actually. 
but it was picked up in the media and then cut, this got a lot of attention at the time because millions of people take these, take these drugs. Well, JAMA, another highly respected medical journal, published a paper a few weeks later, a different group of authors, exact same issue, oral bisphosphonates and the risk of esophageal cancer. And they concluded, sorry, it was a month earlier, among patients in the UK GPRD, the use of oral bisphosphonates was not significantly associated with uh, incident esophageal or gastric cancer. Opposite conclusion, from the clinical point of view, opposite conclusions. One saying there's a problem, the other saying there isn't. And the kicker is, they used the same data. Right? Two different groups of authors looking at the same data arriving at, at opposite conclusions. <clears throat> there is nothing, alas, there is nothing unusual about this. I, I, you, you, could, you could find a dozen, sitting here right now to get your iPad, you can probably find a dozen examples like this. I'll, I'll very rapidly run through a couple of others. Oral fluoroquinolones and the risk of retinal detachment, paper in JAMA. Patients that are taking oral fluoroquinolones were at higher risk. JAMA, same journal, uh, short time data, oral fluoroquinolones was not associated with increased risk of retinal detachment. Pyodidazone, diabetes medication, bladder cancer, this is a serious public health issue. In this study population, pyodidazone does not appear to be significantly associated with, with bladder cancer. Different journals, short time data, the use of pyodidazones is associated with an increased risk of cancer. Same, again, in this particular case, same data. Different, different analysts analyzing the same data, arriving at opposite, opposite conclusions. <coughs> There's a very complicated uh, case that we, we actually discussed in our earlier session briefly um, about a blood thinner called uh, Pradaxa is the brand name, or, or Dibigatrin is the, the generic name. Um, <clears throat> the FDA released a risk communication about this uh, blood thinner, uh, comparing the risk of major bleeds on this blood thinner as against warfarin, which is the sort of standard alternative. So they, they issued a risk communication based on, on a, an observational study in an observational database, and, and concluded that the drug was fine, that the, 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 the risk was lower on the new drug than on the, the old drug, and it was fine to go ahead and use the, uh, the, the, the new drug, which is now generating billions of dollars for its, uh, the, the drug company that's marketing it. Um, paper published uh, in circulation by Jerry Avon, who's a, a, a very prominent uh, epidemiologist, and it concludes with, uh, it's a critique of that, of that study that the FDA did. And his, his concluding sentence is, is, a, is a beautiful piece of prose. Uh, However, the absence of any adjustment for possible confounding and the paucity of actual data made the analysis unsuitable for informing the care of patients. So it sounds genteel and, and nice, but think about what he's, you know, what he's actually saying there. Right? This was an FDA risk communication, official risk communication on the FDA's website. It was on the company's website a very short time later. It is, it is, it's legitimate for them to use it in marketing because it's an official FDA communication. Um, and in the opinion of Jerry Avon, and in my opinion, and I think in many people's opinions, it is not actually suitable for informing the care of patients because the people who take Pradaxa are very different from the people who take Warfarin. We just don't know whether it's the, it's the drugs that are causing the major bleeds or it's some underlying uh, factor that's cause, causing the major bleeds. Uh, and it arrives, the, the, conclusion were, were, the conclusions were at odds with what were seen in randomized trials, which is uh, another issue. So, um, it's kind of the wild west out there in terms of these observational studies. They're all over the place in terms of, of their findings. I contend that the operating characteristics of this procedure I'm, I'm that minute, are completely unknown. Which is to say, the procedure is, I have a concern, bisphosphonates and esophageal cancer. I grab a big database, I design a study, I think hard, I design a study, out pops, I, you know, sort of, I lay an egg, right? out pops a treatment effect, a relative risk or an odds ratio, and maybe a confidence interval, some statistical artifacts. Um, what's the chance that that study gets it right? What's the chance that the confidence interval, if for those who are familiar with these things, a 95% confidence interval, what's the chance it actually contains the truth? It's meant to be 95%, but what is it actually? Is it, is it 95%? Is it 50%? Is it 100%? What is it? So I, I would argue, I would claim, that the operating characteristics of this whole process are entirely unknown. We have no idea how well these studies work. And so when we produce a, an interval, there's, there's three different confidence intervals there for a relative risk. And um, we have no idea which one of those is, is, the, is the right one. There's a heck of a difference between them. The first one, if the confidence interval goes from 1.4 to 1.6, that's saying we're pretty sure there's a 50% increased risk. Of, let's say it's major bleed in this case, or cancer esophagus, or whatever it is, with a very high degree of confidence. But it's, it's a fairly narrow interval. Or maybe the interval should be from 1.02 to 2, in which case it might be a doubling of the risk, but it might be essentially negligible risk, and we don't, we don't know. Or maybe it should be 0.1 to 10. Meaning, we haven't a clue. We've learned basically nothing from, from doing this study. We have no idea which one of those is, is at most accurately represents the evidence that we have generated uh, by, doing this, uh, by doing this study. 
I think I'm going to skip uh, this uh, in the interest of time. Let me, let me just one, one last comment. And so, um, these are observational studies that I'm referring to. So it's, it's as we were talking about earlier, it's, it's digital exhaust, right? These are data that are generated as a byproduct of normal healthcare practice. And we're trying to use them to, to generate evidence, to generate knowledge. Um, th these are very different from randomized trials. So in randomized trials, you actually control who gets the Pradaxa and who gets warfarin, right? or, or whatever, whatever the case might be. Um, so they're, they're very different kinds of these. However, um, there's, there, there are real problems with randomized trials. They're very expensive. You can't do that many of them. There are ethical challenges and, and commercial challenges with doing a lot of randomized trials. And, and even then, there can be real problems with randomized trials. This is a, a sort of a, a random example. And this is a collection of randomized trials. These are 95% intervals from a collection of randomized trials on a particular issue. This is, an, this is a so-called meta-analysis. Um, and the, just what I want to sort of point out here is uh, these are all trials of the same, uh, the same issue. This is, this is a calcium supplementation uh, for, for blood pressure. Um, the study at the top left, the first study, says there's a, the, the, the relative risk is less than one, that it reduces the, the effectiveness, is, is, it's not effective and it's statistically convincing. The one at the bottom right says it is effective and it's statistically convincing in the opposite direction. So just because it's a randomized trial, it is a, higher, it is a higher form of evidence, but that does not mean that a single randomized trial will necessarily give you the right answer. Logically, right? they couldn't possibly both give you the, uh, give you, give you the right answer. Now, let me finish with one last slide. Um, so, pretty very hard to see. Um, if I was brave, I would do this as a, as a real-time demo, but I'm not, I'm not that brave. Um, <laughs> The, another problem with, with a lot of these databases, and then now I'm going to switch back to observational databases, is they are digital exhaust. Right? They are a byproduct of, of healthcare practice. That's why we can generate, we have some, you know, we have millions of them, right? millions of patient records in, in these databases. Some of them are claims databases, they're generated as, as, as a result of financial transactions. Some are electronic health records. This is an example, and I can show you dozens like this, that I just happened to, 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 to look at a couple of days ago. In one of these large databases, this is the prevalence of something called atopic dermatitis. Atopic dermatitis is kind of a vague term for dermatological rashes and <coughs> eczema and psoriasis. And kind of when it's not entirely clear what it is, atopic, <coughs> right? you, any of the clinicians disagree with me, but it's, it's sort of an um, ambiguous term. So the prevalence of atopic dermatitis, this is in, in this particular database, this starts in 1996 and it goes to the present day. The prevalence of atopic dermatitis, I'll do it here, is around two percent, uh, around one percent for years and years and years in this data is around one percent. That at a given moment in 2006, <coughs> I think it is, or 2008, the prevalence jumped from one percent to one and a half percent, and then stayed at one and a half percent. Right? Really? Do you think the prevalence of atopic dermatitis in that population jumped by fifty percent at a given moment in time and then stayed higher? It sort of defies reason that that could be that could be true. We've looked into this. What actually happened was there was a change. This, is, this, this, this comes from claims data. There was a change in coding practice whereby atopic dermatitis was, was, was rewarded, if you will, at a higher, was enumerated at a higher rate than some other things like psoriasis and, and eczema and other kinds of uh, conditions. So one of the problems that of using, there are many problems, but this is just zero to one of them. One of the problems with using these, this kind, these kinds of data is that Anything else that changes around about that time in that database, anything else, any drug that becomes more prevalent because of a marketing campaign or whatever, is going to look like it causes atopic dermatitis because it takes that jump at that point in time. So if, if, if you want to know why are these studies challenging, it's this kind of stuff. Right? That, that, that it just it's extremely difficult to, to, um, to come up with reliable, solid statistical evidence uh, from these kinds of studies. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So I'll, I'll try to give some complementary information to what uh, David provided. Um, I'll spend less time on observational studies and a little bit more on randomized trials and other types of, uh, of evidence that may be helpful to make decisions. And just as a starting point, why would evidence or why would any research findings not be correct, not be reliable, not be credible? Uh, practically, there's two major forces. There's, there's bias and there's random error. And there's bias in whatever study we might do. We cannot avoid that. But uh, observational studies probably have more biases than randomized trials, for example, although randomized trials have their own biases. Then there's random error, which means that we're 
testing lots of hypotheses, we're doing a lot of analysis, and we're trying to find something interesting. And the good thing is that science is very successful. So there's more scientists, there's more of us who are trying to do the same thing. And we have more measurements, and we have more things that we can test, and more things that we can analyze. So this is good news, uh, but at the same time it's bad news, because that multiplicity means that we can get lots of false positives, lots of, of red herrings, lots of, of signals that are not there. So, in, in an observational setting, uh, practically you can get almost any result that you want. Uh, I think this is the conclusion that I have reached after uh, doing that myself multiple times and publishing many papers that uh, apparently probably were not so correct. Um, so here's an empirical evaluation, I call that a cookbook systematic review, because literally we looked at a cookbook, the, the Boston cookbook. Uh, we used a computer to generate random numbers, so we selected random ingredients. Uh, from that uh, cookbook, from recipes, and then we went to the scientific literature and we asked how many have observational studies uh, saying that uh, that particular ingredient increases the risk of cancer or decreases the risk of cancer. And what we found is 40 out of 50 have scientific evidence for increasing or decreasing the risk of cancer. Most of those have evidence both for increasing and for decreasing the risk of cancer. Now, the, the other 10 actually that are not in the list would have been in the list if we had been a bit more uh, expansive in our search. So, uh, for example, vanilla is not there because we searched only for vanilla. But if we were to search for the biochemical ingredients, which is vanillin, there are studies about vanillin and increase or decrease in cancer risk. So the same thing can apply to, to drugs, the same can apply to almost any type of, of exposure. How about randomized trials? Well, discrepancies over time occur even in randomized trials. These are what we call recursive cumulative meta-analysis. Don't get lost in, in the math. Uh, just look at the picture. If you see a flat line, like a uh, brain-dead electroencephalogram, this is good news. It, it means that the evidence does not change over time. We perform more trials, and it, we still get the same results, so nothing changes. If you see fluctuations, that's bad news. It means that our evidence changes a lot. And in some cases, even with randomized trials, we do get a lot of fluctuations. Like in these cases, nitrates and magnesium for myocardial infarction. We had several trials suggesting that there are wonder treatments and they would cut mortality by 50%. Then, oh yeah, they do work, but not 50%, 25%. Then we have very big trials suggesting that no, they do nothing. Uh, they even increase slightly the risk of death. And then more small trials suggesting, no, they're very useful and they cut mortality. So what's going on there? On average, the pattern that we see is that early evidence tends to be more spectacular than late evidence. So if you take mental health interventions like drugs for depression or, or psycho, uh, psychotic diseases, it's far more common to see a strong effect, a uh, major benefit early on in the first trials that we do, and then that effect becomes smaller as we perform additional studies. Not always, but it's more common to see that pattern versus the opposite. Most of the effects in medicine are pretty small. Uh, so we may try to sell uh, a story about medicine being very effective, and uh, uh, I'm sure that there are many effective interventions, but many interventions that are still meaningful and they may have an indication they translate to what we call pretty small relative risk reductions. So uh, these are, for example, 50 interventions uh, that have relative risks of 1.05 or less, uh, which means that on a relative scale, we change things by 5%, 4%, 3%, 2%. To uh, um, come back to the diet example, fruits and vegetables, they are wonderful for your health. And I, I love them, I recommend them. Their reduction in cancer risk is uh, about one in a thousand per serving per day. So, at a population level, it, it makes a huge impact, uh, and tens of thousands of people would be safe from cancer if we had more fruits and vegetables being used. But we're not talking about uh, really cutting cancer in half or or cutting it fourfold. And the same applies to drugs. Most drugs, it may, they may not be a one or two or five percent, maybe a ten percent relative risk reduction, a twenty percent relative risk reduction or so. Still, we run lots of non-randomized studies, even in cases where we could run randomized studies. So, so these are clinical trials, and if you take a look at clinicaltrials.gov, about 50% of phase one and two clinical trials are non-randomized. And if you take into account the non-registration pattern, probably 70 to 80% of clinical trials are not randomized. There's no reason not to randomize them. I mean, it's not that these trials are struggling to incorporate some weird personalized medicine design, some new adaptive whatever X. 
they could have just been randomized. I mean, it's not that, that they collect data after the fact, they do it prospectively, they want to test the drug. The best way to do that would be randomization, but it's still being done, not being done. There's a lot being said about precision medicine and personalized medicine. There's probably uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, that are being pushed in that direction by NIH and all major funders. What is the rationale behind that? Well, the rationale is that randomized trials are too expensive, they take too long, they look at big groups, uh, but you don't know what is happening to the specific patient, so we want to see what is the best treatment for that particular person who has a specific profile. Conceptually, is a very nice idea, but in reality, it almost never works. There, there are exceptions, but the exceptions just testify to the rule. And, and the reason why we cannot use that paradigm to test uh, which one of multiple treatment or management options are best for a particular person is that this type of design doesn't work when you have any of these um, settings. Diseases with high mortality or morbidity. So all major diseases are out of the question. You cannot study cancer. Well, people say, oh, this is what we should cancer. Cancer is what we should study with that. Disease with unstable natural course. Again, most diseases have unstable natural cause. So if you don't have some rigorous control, you don't know whether it was the treatment or just chance that got you better. Diseases where there's no time to try several options consecutively, most of the personalized trials are done in people with terminal disease. Well, if you fail, that's it. Now, if you're successful, you don't know why you were successful. Was it that you would have been successful anyhow? Large carryover effects. If you have a treatment that doesn't go away uh, in terms of what impact it had uh, to the patient once it is given. Dependence of response on previous lines of treatment and their sequence. So it doesn't make a difference if you try A, B, C versus A, C, D or A, B, D, C or whatever. It usually does because people are primed with whatever they had previously and then they have a different response. And finally, small treatment effects. What, what I just mentioned. Um, effects of treatments are usually small. They're meaningful. Lives could be saved, but don't expect tremendous effect sizes. A couple of years ago, we looked across the entire Cochrane database, 85,000 meta-analysis, 230,000 clinical trials. We tried to see how often you find five-fold reduction in mortality by any treatment that has been seen in two trials with significant results and no fluoride bias. We found one treatment that fulfilled these characteristics across almost the entire uh, field of, of medicine, all types of, of indications and diseases. Then. Statistics can make a difference. Uh, David showed you how statistics could make a difference in observational studies. They could make a difference even in randomized trials. So these are trials published in the very best journals, highest impact, uh, and we just tried to see how many of those had reported adjusted and unadjusted analysis for the primary outcome. In theory, it should make a difference. Um, it should be the same because if you have randomization, the two groups should be the same, regardless of whether you adjust or not, it should be about the same. Nevertheless, about 20% of the time, there was a significant result with unadjusted analysis and non-significant with the other version or vice versa. And almost always when that happened, the investigators focused on the significant result. Uh, then we went and we asked the investigators to give us their protocols, and we checked the protocols against what had been published. 50% of the time, the protocol was different compared to what had been published. So e even in, in, in a seemingly rigorous design, it may not be really rigorous. Here's another example. This is steroids for uh, reducing mortality from various diseases. More steroids have been used for almost any disease that you can think of. There's about 3,000 randomized trials that have been performed across uh, diverse medical fields. These are the 14 largest trials on steroids that target mortality, and 9 out of 14 claim significant mortality reductions. Now, if, if you want to have a significant mortality reduction, it means that the, these lines should not be on both sides of the vertical at 1. Uh, and as you see, there's one of them, uh, but unfortunately, it's on the wrong side. Uh, it's uh, head trauma where steroids, if you give steroids, you increase significantly uh, the mortality risk. So what happened with the other trials? What they did is that they performed additional secondary subset, subgroup analysis or excluding some people or using some interesting interpretation. So, for example, myocardial infarction, clearly uh, the line crosses on both sides, but what the author said in that paper is that steroids decrease mortality from myocardial infarction from seven hours to 24 hours after the event and from uh, day seven to, to day 14. Uh, so, 
if you survive seven hours, uh, you're going to do well uh, from seven hours to 24 hours. Then you're going to have a hard time for the next six days, but then for day seven to day 14, you're going to do well and, and then you die. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very complex uh, uh, ways that people can interpret data. Um, we can really get any result we want unless we pre-specify it. Uh, these are plain vanilla analysis of whether different things like uh, beta carotene or vitamin D or whatever else is associated with death risk. Uh, instead of giving you one result, I'm showing you a cloud of results. There's about a million results for each one of these associations because I have used one million different models to estimate the effect. And I can do that if I have 14 other pieces of data, 14 variables. You know, David showed you that. Uh, in, in the simple case, usually we have uh, dozens and hundreds of variables that we can take into account. So depending on what you adjust for, you can get very different results. This is on an observational setting. In a randomized setting, it's less so, but uh, probably it's still an issue. So whatever you read, um, probably have some healthy skepticism. There are some genuine effects out there. Uh, maybe adjust effects downwards, especially with first discoveries and, and first descriptions of, of major treatment effects. Empirically, if you look at uh, journals like Lancet and New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA, uh, and you have trials with less than 30 events, they're pretty small, and they claim a big treatment effect, you need to adjust that at least twofold to get the average expectation of what it would be like. Beware of uh, trials and settings where sponsorship could play tricks. Um, if you look at non-inferiority trials uh, sponsored by uh, industry, uh, and published in 2011, 96% of them give favorable results for the sponsored drug. Uh, so I would say we could eliminate that step. Why do we need trials if 96% of the time they get the right result? Uh, could meta-analysis help? I, I believe a lot in meta-analysis. I, I have uh, uh, been a promoter of meta-analysis for, for a long time and, and an advocate for, for their use. But now that meta-analysis, which combine lots of pieces of evidence and multiple trials or multiple observational studies together have become so prominent and so respectable, there are still biases that have become even more prominent. So uh, there's 185 meta-analyses evaluating antidepressants for depression in the last six years, and uh, about 80% uh, of them have some industry involvement. 29% uh, of them have even industry employees authoring them. And if you look at the conclusions, about 50% of those that don't have any industry involvement say that there are caveats about antidepressants. Only one out of 54 of those that have employees from the industry involved had any caveats about antidepressants, and I'm not even sure whether these employees are still employed. <laughs> guidelines, can you trust guidelines? Uh, guidelines supposedly take the best expertise, they take the best evidence, randomized, observational, whatever else, and they conclude that this is what you have to do. Don't waste time, you don't have time, you're a busy clinician, uh, you just want to make a decision. Most guidelines have multiple problems. There are multiple problems in the generation, in the synthesis, in the interpretation, in the conclusions about evidence. And recently, along with several other colleagues, we tried to put out a list of red flags that if you see a major guideline, you need to be very careful about how you interpret that and whether you act on that and how you act. Um, I'll just stop here with that slide, location, location, location. Uh, we tend to have uh, kind of a US-based view in, in most of the research that we do, uh, but this is a global forum, and be prepared that the US is no longer number one in terms of uh, productivity of papers, and very soon we will be lagging behind not just the EU, but also China. And uh, there's tons of trials that are done outside of uh, the US or, or Europe, and many clinical trials uh, are happening currently in India and China and other uh, countries that don't have a very strong tradition of uh, clinical research. So recently we looked at how the results of trials done in China, India, and other countries that don't have a strong tradition of clinical research compare against trials done in Europe and the US. And we found that consistently there's a pattern of overestimation of effects for trials done in other countries. Uh, this is a classic example. If you believe the, the Chinese study, then uh, calcium antagonists would be a miracle drug, uh, counting mortality sevenfold if you have a stroke. But based on data from multiple very well, very well done studies in the US and Europe, they don't practically do anything. So uh, I'll stop here uh, and uh, hopefully open the discussion. Uh, David, thank you very much.
extremely depressing. Um, <laughs> uh, John has convinced us that um, uh, statistically you're healthy until you die. <laughs> no interventions with treatments, we get the drugs don't work. Uh, uh, diet doesn't work, left out my favorite exercise, but I'm sure statistically we find the same. Uh, uh, David has, shown, has demonstrated his, his field of, of academic research is actually useless. <laughs> Since uh, observational studies and, and improving the out output of observational studies is, is something that he and his colleagues have worked on for a long time, and apparently uh, to, to little avail. Um, but I, I'd like to just try to be more positive here. If good. Um, the couple of reality. Uh, one is you know this this whole notion of you know uh, you know digital uh, data streams right there, and, and I write a lot about what we call data science these days. The, you know, in, in healthcare and medicine, we aren't betting the pharma, but we're betting a lot. I mean, it, it starts in a small way, really, with the thing that gets the most attention, which is electronic health records and pick your number. We're putting incentives worth $27 billion in that. Um, and that's just the catch basin. I mean, people, for all its flaws, physicians say they hate it. You know, they're, they're, you can get anecdotal uh, cases of, uh, you know, air, causing errors and so forth. But it's, the idea is to digitize all this stuff, right? And, and but then that becomes, and it's been the vision of at least two administrations. First, the Bush administration, uh, in starting in 2004, appointed a national health information uh, technology coordinator. Um, and now we have these subsidies under the Obama administration. And, you know, the idea is that you can, that this is a valuable resource in some way. That you can, um, you can see things. You know, it's just like any measurement tool um, that you can sort of see, sense, and act potentially in ways you couldn't before and have a more rounded picture. And, and what's, you know, start out with John, I, you know, what's, this data is around, it's going to be used, how do you improve the outcome? Or, or and I, you can be negative if you want to, I mean, why is it, why is it seeming, why is it, what are the forces that make it seemingly so good? So the, the, the fact that we have data available does not mean that uh, data should be used. Uh, let alone that, that you know you should make inferences and change your life or, or change your, your treatment or management or, or expectations based on that. I, I, I think I, I cannot generalize that all data is to be just thrown to the wastebasket. Each piece of, of a data set has some strengths and some weaknesses. And there can be some tailored situations where you may find some clear uh, biomarkers that would really tell you that this is exactly what you need to do. Uh, Maybe a few cases that you may have success stories, but I, I think that the expectations about the frequency and the magnitude of the success stories based on data that are collected for non-research purposes, but pe by people who are not really doing research, who are not measuring things for uh, you know, the meticulous accuracy that is needed for these tiny and small effects that I was describing, is, is just entirely unrealistic. And, uh, I have no problem since these databases are out there to see papers published about them, but I want to see uh, some uncertainty tag attached to them and some caveat lector, uh, beware, this is just a hypothesis generating and uh, an interesting observation. We don't really know what it means. Well, let me ask, and, you know, many of your examples, and both yours and Dave, looked at interventions. That is, you know, um, medicines that were administered and, and you know there's an initial fact that seems greater than quality, whatever um, but isn't a lot of what you know people want to do with this in the area of uh, you know managing chronic diseases and this is you know with the 18 trillion dollars a year that we spend in healthcare, 70 or 80 percent of it is in those five diseases right and and i you know john you have know, it, you know and and i mean there's a huge personal effect as well. I mean, a diabetes person, I mean, maybe statistically live no longer, but it would you know, be nice not to go blind and have your leg cut off, right? Yeah. I mean, if you can manage those diseases in a way that there's a, there's a human benefit, and presumably, I mean, you know, overall there may not be. If people live longer, it's supposed to the healthcare system much. Sure. I mean, it's, you know, the, that 18 trillion may not go down, but, um, but it, it's on this sort of other side of it that seems it's kind of, to, you know, you can make some of these so-called causal inferences, right, that might be useful in the same way that you know, the Framingham study from the 60s really fingered smoking as being linked to heart disease and cancer. And then people looked at it, I mean, it, it generated the hypothesis, to use your and then kind of people looked at it and we saw what happened. 
and you know, as everyone says, I mean, nothing that's ever been done in cancer, right, has ever got ever close to cutting out smoking, you know. And I, I, what about that side? Some optimism. I, I, I think that smoking is a great example, uh, but you know, we have smoking, and and we could get rid of, of most of these diseases just by eliminating smoking. Uh, we would save about a billion lives over the next century. So. Uh, you know, that's something that we already know and we do very little about uh, containing, uh, you know, all over the world. Will we find lots of smoking uh, type of uh, uh, discoveries? I, I doubt. I mean, I think that we may find some effects that are strong as smoking, which increases your risk of cancer 20-fold and risk of cardiac disease 10-fold. But it, it would pertain to very, very few people. So it, it would be perhaps some mutations or, or some... Uh, uh, genomic profile or, or some pharmacogenomic effect that would increase the risk tenfold, but it would pertain to uh, maybe one out of 50,000 people, one out of 10,000 people. Uh, and along with that, we will find lots of noise. So it's very important to, to keep that uh, perspective that we need some validation and some standardization of that process, uh, both for discovery and for validation, before we can act on it. So, can I say something positive? <laughs> so I think these data are, there's huge promise in these data for informing healthcare practice, both for chronic diseases and for, you know, for other kinds of, for acute situations. The key issue is the methods we're using proceed as if, the, as if a whole host of problems we know exist, they proceed as if they don't exist. So what we need, what we need to do is, is come up with methods, algorithms, methods, epidemiological methods, statistical methods that are honest, that actually account for the real uncertainty. The problem right now is we're putting out analysis where we think we, we've learned something fairly precise, but in fact we've learned something rather vague in many cases. So it seems to me that's, that is where the focus ought to be, is on developing honest inferential methods for coming up with truly honest inferences that account for the real uncertainty. I think there's a lot of problems. That, that's not a pipe dream. There's, there's, there are some ideas kicking around, and there are, there are I think there's a real possibility of, make, of making progress in, in that regard. Let, let me answer one last one before I'm asking out here. I mean, um, you know, the, the goal for the here enthusiasts we talked about is that they're going to make, you know, they want to make medicine as quantitatively mature as other disciplines like physics or climatology. Um, is progress toward that direction realistic, or are there fundamental differences in the in the nature of the sort of um, you know measurement measurement and statistical challenge? I, I can take a shot at that. I, I think that uh, there are both similarities and differences. Uh, on average, medicine is more complex. Uh, you know, biological systems in general are more complex than physical phenomena. And human uh, behavior and, and human uh, health is, is extremely complex. So, uh, if anything, this means that uh, we need even more rigorous quantitative approach. We need even more standardization. We need even more careful in our measurements and our interpretation of the measurements. I, I, I'm not arguing that uh, we should perform medicine without data, and that would be the completely wrong conclusion about what we need to do. But we need to uh, be careful about what are uh, the possibilities of different pieces of data and, and what their limitations are, because some of these limitations are far more prominent compared to the physical sciences. Well, if all of you are, not, are depressed, you can imagine how I feel. <laughs> Since I have to take care of patients tomorrow in my clinic. Um, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting because um, to listen to both of these talks, because I think there has been an attempt, a transformation that's happened over the past decades in terms of really people or uh, clinicians or young trainees or medical students are really being geared much more in the direction of trying to move away from very um, ad hoc, expert opinion kind of practice to more of what's called evidence-based um, practice. Of course, the problem is what is the evidence? And in order to do evidence-based practice, you have to have high quality evidence. And that's, that's the problem. Um, and I, going back to the large data bases, I, I feel like there's everybody's looking for a magic bullet. Uh, that, that somehow having yeah, using electronic medical records is going to give us the answers to all the questions, every question that can ever anybody has, that somehow by mining these uh, databases we will arrive at an answer with some confidence to these questions. And there are lots of you know, caveats to this as was described um, by, by several of the speakers. And, and the, the dynamic is what to do. I mean, I think is, uh, 
the question is how to abandon, I believe, the, the, not to abandon the quest for evidence, uh, but rather it's to try to think of the need for different types of evidence, for different kinds of questions maybe, and then also trying to have a reinterpretation of that evidence to be put um, in some kind of rational uh, sphere or trying to actually uh, have the conclusions be consistent with what the evidence says. But I, I, and, uh, and the challenge is that I think is uh, we're inundated with information. And part of the, the problem for clinicians, physicians, or for patients, or for public health uh, programmers is just so much information. The numbers of clinical trials for one condition, for example, looking at depression, are just enormous and proliferating. And publication venues are increasing all the time. So it's practically impossible for anyone uh, to be able to digest this information and to digest it in a rigorous way. So, you know, what are the mechanisms and how do we put to get put in place the kinds of mechanisms that allow for generation of high quality evidence appropriately, but also digesting, synthesizing uh, this evidence into a way that can be utilized and appropriately by the human to utilize them. And I, I, I think that's the challenge ahead of us, is how to do that. I also think there's a, a major issue which you both highlighted, the issue of communication. Whether the researchers themselves, how they communicate the results is a problem. Uh, there's often uh, a uh, temptation of exaggerating the findings, uh, especially the positive findings. There's a bias to publication for positive findings rather than negative findings. Uh, there's a tendency to exaggerate the, 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 the effect. Uh, and also to look at subsets of uh, populations. There's a, also a tendency as well to uh, to not explicitly and transparently put forth the caveats uh, that are implicit in the study designs and the interpretation. So a culture of more transparency, more honesty, and, uh, and also maybe a little bit more of a thought in, a thoughtfulness in terms of how to communicate uh, the results of the evidence. And that applies I mean, that's a challenge for physicians like myself or trying to do public health, is how to translate this evidence into action and how to help my patients make a decision, but it's also as well for uh, just our audience in terms of your role in translating the findings from the scientific output to the public at large and how to really uh, simplify but also accurately reflect very complex concepts and um, and also how to transmit, uh, I think the challenge is that there's so much uncertainty in medicine, uncertainty in terms of these results. And people are not comfortable with uncertainty. People are not comfortable with, we think it's going to work, or it works in 20% of the time, or it works in 5% of the time, or it's been found to, to work in, uh, I don't know, some subset. And uh, I find, for example, in my own my own patients, if I provide them with the evidence, I say, you know, they often look at me and say, what do you think I should do? Which is like really a frightening question. <laughs> but I cannot tell you how often that happens, is that people just say, but what, would you, what, do you think, what do you think I should do? And I've just given them like a, an exposition of all the evidence, and uh, it's, uh, it's tough. And uh, how do we enable people to be able to understand, appreciate, what the evidence is saying, while at the same time empowering them to make their own decisions. And that's not very easy. Um, and, uh, and how to transmit the sense of uncertainty when it's an issue of life and death is also not very easy, both for the physician as well as for the patient as well on the other side. So I don't know what the answer is, but I think the, um, probably I think what you're both talking about is maybe trying to get stronger evidence for the important questions. Um, and I think... Market no, honest evidence for all or the or, uh, or honest, yes, exactly. And then, and then translate that in an honest way, and interpret it in an honest way, and keep on questioning the evidence. I guess that's the other issue, is the iterative process. And I think it's very interesting to, sh to see what happens early results versus later results. And that's also something to, uh, to also advocate for. But I think my concern is, and I wonder whether you address this is I feel there's a certain bias now against clinical trials. Uh, I've heard that from several researchers, I've heard it from funders as well. There's a sense that now that we have these large databases, 
that are collecting all the stuff why do we need clinical trials so there's a bias I find it's much harder to get funding for uh, clinical trials especially for large clinical trials um, and how do we fight against this perception that clinical trials are the old way of doing things um, and because I think that's very worrisome that that's a real perception now in the field. So I don't know, John. That, that, that's, that's extremely unfortunate. In, in, indeed, NIH has uh, almost eliminated funding for clinical trials over the years. The, the, maybe the perception behind that is that um, the, you know, methodology designs are like uh, an omics chip. That, you know, the, the latest and more novel tool is better. And, and people think that, oh, uh, these big databases are, are now coming to the forefront and clinical trials have been out there since 1948, they must be old, and it's not so. Randomized trials are the best designed to understand treatment effects, uh, and, and there's not even any sense of comparing them against uh, databases of observational nature, how, no matter how big they are, no matter how sophisticated they are in, in their technology of data collection and, uh, and the analytical clouds that they can build, they're just suboptimal. I mean, it's, it's like a completely crazy that the wish to adopt uh, a novel design, which actually is prehistoric design to my mind, is, is killing randomized clinical trials. So uh, I would argue that we just need to go back. I think that public funders who are interested in getting important and clear answers about drugs or interventions or anything that will be used by public and people, they should fund randomized controlled trials. Uh, and if they have money to spare for observational data sets, that's fine. I would suggest that these data sets may be better to be funded by private initiatives who really want to make some discoveries and then try to patent them. And if they make them, you know, let them patent them and make money downstream with you know, finding the new mutation or the new test or the new risk factor that nobody had a clue about uh, for so long. But uh, I think it's a complete uh, inversal of, of uh, what it should be.